Uh, today we'll cover memory scheduling. This is another exciting topic. Actually, this is a topic very close to my heart. I've been working on this for a long time. So we'll cover state of the art as well as some research proposals that we've had as well as others have had. So this should be exciting. It'll be a whirlwind tour of memory scheduling, I think. I can go really fast, so if you have questions, please stop me. Uh, but hopefully everything will be clear. But before that, you know that Homework 6 is due uh, April 19th. And these cover topics like virtual memory, cache interaction, main memory, memory scheduling. And my strong suggestion, you should remember, complete this before the exam to prepare for the exam. And again, homeworks are mainly for your benefit. Uh, grades are not important on homeworks, as you already figured out. Lab 6 is on memory hierarchy. It's due April 22nd. And this should be fun, too. And to get extra credit, do some prefetching and come up with interesting algorithms to do that. And homework 6 and lab 6 are synergistic. If you work on them together, you'll understand the material better. And the midterm is coming up next week, April 17th. Similar format and probably length as midterm 1. Uh, again, do homework 6 to prepare. Last lecture, we've covered DRAM refresh. Uh, we've looked at ways of reducing refresh impact and how this is going to become a bigger problem in the future. So hopefully you're thinking of devising methods to get rid of it better than we have. Uh, we talked about memory controllers, structure, their structure and operation. And we've started memory access scheduling. And I'll briefly talk about row hit first scheduling again to refresh your memories. Today, we'll mainly focus on memory interference and techniques to manage it. Uh, with, a, with a focus on memory request scheduling. And if time permits, very likely it won't permit, we'll go into emerging memory technologies and how to incorporate some of these technologies we briefly touched on, like phase change memory, spin torque transfer, MRAM, into the memory hierarchy of today's systems. And last 15 minutes, or actually, if you, want, if you would like longer, uh, we'll, we'll schedule it dynamically. We'll have a question and answer with uh, Dr. Bill Strecker, uh, whom I told you about. We have actually uh, Bill Strecker and his uh, wife, Nancy Strecker, which are both wonderful human beings uh, that are here with us. Uh, and Bill is the architect of VAX. You can ask him hard, tough questions on VAX. Uh, and uh, I've already told you that he's a computer architect. So you can ask him what computer architecture was like uh, during the time he designed the VAX. Okay. And actually, I have other guests also. My parents are here as well. So you can ask them questions, too, if you would like <laughs> afterwards, though, after I leave. <laughs> you can complain to them about the labs that you're doing. <laughs> OK, this was your recommended reading, uh, some of the papers uh, Bill wrote. OK, uh, let's go and jump into the lecture topic. Uh, memory interference and scheduling. This was a picture I showed you earlier. This is the, what a modern DRAM controller looks like. It takes requests from uh, different L2 cache banks, which could be serving different processors. And it's normally partitioned into bank request buffers, although it doesn't have to be. This is the static versus dynamic partitioning of the buffer space, right, or the scheduler. And you should, have, you should be very familiar with the trade-offs of static versus dynamic partitioning of any space in general. But this is one that has request buffers for each bank and schedulers for each bank, per bank scheduler. And there's a bus scheduler that arbitrates between those schedulers because the bus is shared across different banks. And you, you can have scheduling decisions that are made at both uh, places. And this is, again, to jog your memory. A DRAM bank looks like a two-dimensional structure, columns and rows. And you have a row buffer. And you need to read the data from the row buffer because that's where the sense amplifiers sit. And they amplify the data. Initially, this is empty. You access a row. In order to access a row in an empty row buffer, in this case, uh, row address 0, you need to activate the row, which places the row into the row buffer. Then the memory controller needs to send the column address, which, and the DRAM chip responds by muxing out that column data to the memory controller. I'm going through this relatively fast because you've seen this several times so far. And if the next access is to the same row, you get a row buffer hit. And now you don't need to activate the row because the row buffer already contains the row which means that the memory control only needs to send the column address to uh, have the chip uh, mux out the data at that column. You know, notice that this is much faster than a row buffer miss, which we had earlier. Now you access row 0 again. That's a hit. And then the appropriate column is muxed out. If you need to access another row, now the memory controller needs to first pre-charge the row buffer, pre-charge the array, because it's a row buffer conflict, which takes time. Then the memory controller needs to activate the row 
row one, which takes time. And then the memory controller needs to send the column address, again, which takes some more time to send the data. So a row conflict access takes much longer than a row hit access. It's actually two to three times longer. And current take controllers actually take advantage of this fact, because row, row buffers, uh, uh, if, if a request hits in the row buffer, you would like to prioritize that. And they employ a commonly used policy, at least they used to employ, they have more sophisticated mechanisms now, uh, a, a policy called first ready, first come, first served scheduling policy, which prioritizes row hit requests over others, and all else being equal, all, all the requests over others. There are two goals. One is to maximize row buffer hit rate, which maximizes DRAM throughput. The second is by prioritizing all the requests, you ensure forward progress, right? There's some amount of forward progress, which is different from fairness, as we will see. So is this a good policy in a multi-core system? I think you know the answer already because I've given you uh, that, uh, um, that picture of MATLAB and GCC very early on in my first lecture. Right? Do you remember that, the blue MATLAB and red GCC? Actually, I don't remember if, which one was blue or red. But today we have many cores on chip, and there are reasons for this that we've briefly talked about. Uh, they're simpler and lower power than a single large core, and they enable large-scale parallelism on chip. And this is already an outdated slide. And I cannot keep up with all of these different processes, uh, so hopefully you are keeping up. What we ideally want is we want n times the system performance with n times the cores. But because of memory interference, that's not what we get. What we get today is uh, a picture that I've showed you uh, a couple of times earlier. This is an experiment we did. Uh, we ran MATLAB and GCC together on two core system. And you measure the slowdown of each application compared to when it's run alone on the same system. MATLAB slows down by only 7%. GCC slows down by almost 3x. As a result, you don't get n times the performance if you make the calculation. Uh, with a two-core system, you don't get 2x the performance, system performance. In fact, you have a bigger issue. What if GCC was important uh, in the system? You, get, you go and in the operating system assign high priority to GCC and low priority to MATLAB, and nothing changes. Because those priorities are not communicated to the hardware. Right? Because these, are, these two uh, applications are running together on two cores. So uh, what was the problem? You've seen this picture. I've, I'm going to abstract these applications as stream and random purposefully. Uh, GC, uh, and these two applications generate requests to the memory controller. And the memory controller, for some reason, prioritizes the streaming application over and over. As a result, the random access application stars. Uh, well, we've actually written programs. This is from the memory performance attacks paper, and I don't remember if I assigned this. This was required. Was this required reading? You guys remember? Recommended. It was recommended. Okay, it wasn't required. Okay, I don't want to <laughs> burden you with more reading, so I won't make it required now. But we've actually done this experiment with a stream workload. This is a workload that's used to test memory bandwidth on existing systems. It's a stream application, and this is one portion of it. It initializes two large arrays, A and B. And it basically uh, goes through and copies one array to the other, or does some operations on multiple arrays and co uh, copies that to the other. And the point is it's a streaming workload. The addresses stream through a memory. The address is co consecutively increasing. So it's sequential memory access. As a result, it has very high robot for locality, 96% hit rate, according to the measurements. It's memory intensive because we made sure that every access is a cache miss. If you do this, if you multiply, uh, uh, if, if the blocks that you're accessing are, uh, if, the, if each access is to a different cache block, that's what you get. So you take this application, and we also studied a control application, which is random access, which is exactly the same as stream if you look at this, except indices are determined randomly. Right. So you copy one array to another, but the order in which you do that copy of uh, the array elements is random within those elements. That's the only difference between the two workloads. As a result, you get random memory access and very low robot for locality, but similarly memory intensive because the probability of accessing the same cache line when you generate a random index is very low. Okay. So if you run these two applications together, what happens? Let's take a look at this bank that we've seen, and this is the memory request buffer, and both applications are generating requests that stay in the memory request buffer, and T0 is stream, the blue application is stream. And what happens is, let's assume that initially row buffer is open with row 0, the streaming application keeps generating requests to row zero. And the memory controller keeps prioritizing the requests that go to row zero because the other requests coming from the random application do not hit in the row buffer. They are to a different look, a row, right? As a result, 
you get starvation for a while. The random application request is not serviced, right? So you can do the calculation with a row size of 8 kilobytes and a cache block size of 64 bytes. 128 requests of the streaming application are serviced before any a single request of a random access application. And this could become worse with the row size, of course. Uh, so there is a problem, right? The memory, uh, you have a memory hog application. And this is the results from a real system. Uh, this was from December 2006 uh, on an Intel Pentium D running uh, Windows XP. But you get similar results with many different processors. Probably not today. If you want to repeat that experiment today, probably uh, manufacturers have fixed, uh, partly uh, based on our publications in the field. Uh, but I'd be curious if you'd like to do that study and <laughs> try to get, the, get similar results. So yeah, stream and random, uh, that's ra they're running together. Stream slows down by 18%. Random slows down by almost 3x. Very similar to MATLAB and GCC that you've so seen. But this is a much more controlled experiment, right? The only difference between the two workloads is the row buffer hit rate. And this actually happens with many different workloads. Your stream is a good memory performance hog, basically. <laughs> it hogs the memory. So this is, again, a result from a real system. GCC gets slowed down significantly. And this was Microsoft's virtual machine back then. And that gets slowed down significantly. It's virtual PC. It's like VMware. OK, this becomes a bigger problem as you increase the number of cores in the system. This is, again, main memory is the only shared resource. We are on four different applications. This is from the SPEC 2006 suite on four different cores. And we measure the slowdown of each application compared to when it's run alone on the same system. LibQuantum, which resembles stream very much, it's a quantum computing simulator. And it streams through memory in many of its phases, slows down by only 5%. It's very memory intensive, too. Uh, and another application, Omnet, slows down by almost 8x. So you get unfair slowdown of different threads. Uh, uh, and as a result, you also get low system performance. Because if you look at these two applications, these are not very memory intensive. They only once in a while generate requests to memory. Uh, and uh, their requests get delayed uh, be, uh, behind the request of these more intensive applications. As a result, these cores make very slow progress. So your system utilization goes down. Right? You're basically servicing these cores that are very memory intensive. They're stalling anyway. But you're also not servicing those cores that are not memory intensive. If you had serviced their requests, if you prioritized their requests, they would have made a lot of progress in the cores, whereas you're blocking almost all the cores now. So you get low system performance. You get vulnerable to denial of service as well. It's very easy to write this application, libquantum, because it's basically a memory streaming application. And if you, if you can actually sneak this application into somebody's data center, it would deny service to many different uh, other uh, applications. Right? And you get priority inversion. You cannot enforce. Uh, uh, priorities. You cannot solve this problem at the operating system level without losing significant throughput. You can solve the system on an operating system level, right? If you really care about only Omnet PP, just run Omnet PP on a four-core system, right? But your system utilization goes down. That's not, that's not interesting. That's not fun engineering. OK, and also there is another problem, which is predictable performance. Uh, the performance of an application, for example, Omnet PP, depends on what other core runners are on the other cores? Because there is no control in the system. If you look here, the Omnet PP slows down by only uh, 5x or so. Here it has slowed down by 8x. So there is no performance predictability. You cannot isolate these different applications' performance. But we would like that because we may want to satisfy some performance guarantees. For example, for H.264, right? which is a video encoding application. So as a result, what we have is an uncontrollable, unpredictable system. And we'd like to make this predictable. Okay. Uh, and this problem will get more uh, bigger. Uh, there are results in the papers bigger as you add more cores into the system. Because you might be uh, running 100 different applications, and only one of them is being prioritized by the memory controller. You lose significant system throughput. So how do we solve the problem? Let me restate the problem a little bit. The problem is uh, the memory controller's pins and memory banks are shared. And pin bandwidth is not increasing as fast as the number of cores which means that bandwidth per core is reducing. And different threads executing on the cores, on different cores, interfere with each other in the main memory system. There are two effects of this interference that we will look at. One is threads delay each other by causing resource contention. We've seen this already. You get bank, bus, robot for conflicts. As a result, you get reduced DRAM throughput. And you hopefully know some ways of dealing, reducing these conflicts. But even if you reduce these conflicts, eventually uh, you'll have a conflict if you have contention, right? This always happens to me at the gym, for example. Even though there are so many lockers over there, there will be someone over there at the gym 
that, ha that is right next to me in this, in this locker. So we always have that contention. <laughs> Even if the gym is empty, that happens. <laughs> So you cannot get, this is a very fundamental problem. It have, you, can, you can figure out ways of, uh, in your own life probably. The second problem, which is probably harder to identify, but threads can destroy each other's DRM bank parallelism. If a thread is running alone, it can utilize different banks and it can parallelize its requests or different channels. Whereas if another thread is interfering, now those requests may become serialized. So you lose the benefits you get from memory level parallelism, you, uh, overlapping of latencies. And we will see this problem. Uh, OK, so what are these effects? We, uh, you'll have queuing and contention delays, band conflicts, bus conflicts, and channel conflicts. And there are additional delays due to DRAM constraints, which I'll not go into that much. But row conflict is an additional delay due to a DRAM constraint. This is also called a protocol overhead. You, in order to close a row, you need to do a pre-charge uh, command, right? That's overhead, basically. You don't get any benefit from that. Uh, you, don't, you don't utilize the data bus with a pre-charge uh, pre command. Similarly, if you're switching between read and writes, you cannot do reads and writes at the same time in DRAM. If a thread is doing a lot of writes, if another thread is doing a lot of reads, uh, one thread may cause the memory controller to switch to doing writes, whereas, uh, uh, while reads, which are more important for the other thread, are being delayed. And there are also dead cycles in this switch. There's a, if you remember from the last lecture, there's a write to write, uh, write to read switching penalty and read to write switching penalty, which can become more significant if your memory bandwidth is contended. And we get loss of interthread parallelism, which I told you that I'll go into more detail about. So the problem is we have uh, memory controllers that are not aware of quality of service or interference. Uh, existing DRAM controllers uh, do not try to solve this issue. They simply aim to maximize DRAM throughput. And for good reason, too, because they were designed for single core systems. Right? They were uh, uh, if, if you have only single application running in the system, maybe, and this is also not true, maybe you would like to maximize this DRAM throughput. And you can imagine why this is not true, right? Uh, if you, you can maximize DRAM throughput, but there may be a critical request in the application that's on your critical path. Maybe that's a better thing to do, but that's a tough thing to determine, which, which request is critical, which request is more critical than the other. But I'll encourage you to think about it. Uh, we may get back to that later on. But today's controllers, many controllers, are thread unaware. They're, as a result, they're unfair. They have no intent to service each thread's request in parallel also. The FRFCFS policy has two uh, rules. One is row hit first, and the other is oldest first. And they're both unfair. Right? If you do row hit first, it unfairly prioritizes those threads that keep it hitting in the row buffer. And oldest first, as we've already also discussed in the earlier lectures, is also unfair because if a thread has lots of requests, they will appear older to the memory scheduler compared to a thread that has fewer requests. Right? So you would really like to prioritize the thread that has fewer requests so that its core makes progress. But oldest first does the exact opposite. Right? Because if you generate 10 requests, they arrive earlier than one request than, uh, that is generated by a thread that's not very memory intensive. OK. So, so what is the solution? So the solution is actually to design this memory controller such that it's quality of service aware. If you look at the memory controller, it's one of its functions, at least in today's system, is to resolve memory contention by scheduling requests. Uh, so how do we schedule requests to provide high system performance, high fairness to applications? We've already talked about this. But you would also like to make this controller configurable to system software. The system software should be able to say, this application is more important. Prioritize it, memory controller. We don't have that today. Well, we have it as going forward. Uh, and memory controllers need to be aware of threads to satisfy all of these. And let's take a look at how can we uh, do this? How can we achieve this? Any questions so far, by the way? Or was this all pretty much review? OK, good. Uh, let's take a look at When we first started looking at this problem, uh, we probably did the obvious thing at the time. Uh, well, the problem is this, so I'll skip this. But uh, the idea was, our goal was, because we saw these unfair slowdowns, our goal was to design a perfectly fair system. And what is a fair system? Our definition at the time was to balance the slowdown of these threads that are interfering with each other. Instead of having all of these uh, widely varying, why not have a, a memory scheduler that balances all of those slowdowns at three, for example? That's the idea of stall time fair memory scheduling. Uh, threads that are sharing the memory system should experience similar slowdowns when they're run alone. So that's fair scheduling. 
This also improves overall system performance because now you don't have this problem of some cores being stalled for a long time. Right? You get better system utilization, hopefully. You enable more proportional progress of different cores in the memory system. And the idea was to have the memory controller estimate each thread slowdown due to interference and schedule the request in a way to balance the slowdowns. Now, how do you do that? I will not go into too much detail, but I'll give you the basic ideas. Uh, the, we, the definition of its fair DRAM system is it is fair if it equalizes the slowdown of equal priority threads relative to when each thread is run alone on the same system. So you need to define some things. DRAM related stall time of a thread is the time a thread spends waiting for DRAM memory. And there are two parameters of a thread. One is stall time shared. This is the DRAM related stall time when the thread runs with other threads uh, in a multi-core system. And ST alone, stall time alone, is the stall time of the thread when the thread runs alone on the same system. So if you'd like to calculate slowdown, you divide the stall time shared uh, by stall time alone. This gives you the relative increase in stall time. So if a thread is running 10 seconds when it's running with other threads versus one second when it's run, running alone, ST, uh, the slowdown is 10, 10x. And the idea of the stall time fair memory schedule, I'll call STFM from now on, is to equalize memory slowdown for interfering threads. If a thread is not interfering, it makes no sense to increase its slowdown, right? Uh, without sacrificing performance, that's the hope. That's not a guarantee. So this aims to allow proportional progress of threads, which is actually a very good thing for, from an operating system point of view. If you think about the higher level uh, stack, software stack, let's say the operating system is scheduling four uh, different applications on a four core system, it's assuming that they will all make progress, right? Whereas if, if the hardware is unfair, one of them may be making a progress for one instruction only. You don't want that, right? You want proportional progress so that the operating system's uh, scheduling policies are effective also. Okay, so how do you do this? Uh, you can read the paper. This is again recommended but not required reading. For each thread, the DRAM controller needs to keep track of stall time shared. And this is relatively easy, right? When the threads are running together with each other, you can easily keep track of how much each thread is stalling because uh, of a memory request, because of a DRAM request. The difficult part is stall time alone. How do you figure out how long a thread would have stalled if it were running alone on the same system while it's actually running together with other threads? And that's uh, the innovation that I will not go into, but you can imagine ways of doing that. So I'll give you the key idea. So uh, for, uh, for uh, the memory controller knows when it prefers one thread over the other, right? When it does the scheduling decision. It can keep track of how much each thread is delayed because of that. So this is excess cycles that thread incurs because the memory controller preferred that thread, preferred some other thread over this thread. So you can take this excess cycles and you can compute these excess cycles somehow. And if you subtract those excess cycles from the stall time shared, so you, can, you know stall time shared, you can compute this. Uh, and you can express stall time alone as stall time shared minus some stall time excess. And these are the excess cycles that thread has incurred because while it had already request in the memory request buffer, the memory controller preferred some other thread. Of course, it's actually not that easy to estimate this because there is a lot of parallelism that goes on in the memory system. So there are a lot of hacks, as you will see in the paper. Uh, that are employed. Well, hack is a bad name for it, perhaps, but it's really uh, engineering approximations, you can say that. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you estimate that, uh, each cycle, now the DRAM controller can compute a slowdown value, which is stall time shared divided by stall time alone, where stall time alone is estimated this way. And uh, it computes unfairness in the system, which is the maximum slowdown in the system divided by the minimum slowdown in the system for any thread. If the unfairness is less than some threshold, which I will call the maximum, maximum tolerable unfairness threshold, it uses the DRAM throughput-oriented scheduling policy that we discussed, the row hit first scheduling policy. If unf unfairness is not bearable, then it uh, switches to a fairness-oriented scheduling policy where it prioritizes the request from the thread that has a maximum slowdown so that we keep the maximum slowdown in check. Right? And that's the first priority. The second priority, we would still like to uh, prioritize row hits and older requests. Let's take a look at how this actually works with the example that uh, we've seen, streaming and random application. T0 is the stream, T1 is the random application. We keep track of the slowdown of each thread, 
And unfairness is basically the division of these slowdowns. And let's assume that we have an alpha value of 1.05, maximum tolerable uh, slowdown. And streaming applications requests uh, get prioritized for a while. Initially, unfairness is less than alpha value, so we use a throughput-oriented scheduling policy. Row zero is open, so streaming application requests uh, to row zero is prioritized over uh, red applications request, which causes slowdown to T1, right? The memory controller keeps track of that, and unfairness increases. Next request, streaming application is again prioritized, which causes more slowdown to T1, and unfairness increases. At this point, unfairness becomes unbearable, greater than alpha, and the memory controller switches to uh, the fairness-oriented scheduling policy. It prioritizes the uh, thread that has been slowed down the most, which is T1. So even though row 0 is open in the row buffer, the uh, uh, the memory controller picks a request from the maximum slowdown thread. So it schedules the request from T1. Now that causes slowdown to the streaming application, right? Because if it were running alone, uh, it would have scheduled its request. And the row buffer has changed now. So that brings down the unfairness again. And the memory controller switches to the uh, throughput-oriented scheduling policy. It uses the oldest first algorithm. and that uh, causes a slowdown, that increases slowdowns appropriately. And the uh, memory controller basically keeps switching between these two different policies to keep the slowdown in check. You can actually do the animation yourself uh, to convince that it actually works. Okay? The idea is you keep unfairness in check uh, by keeping track of the slowdowns and switching between two policies. It's nice, right? Well, it was nice to us at that time, but it's not, it's not that nice anymore. <laughs> the, well, uh, what are the upsides of this? Any, any thoughts? I'll give you one. It's actually the first algorithm to, for mu fair multi-core memory scheduling. and provides a mechanism to estimate memory slowdown of a thread, which is actually kind of obsolete now. One of my students came up with a better mechanism that you can estimate the slowdown uh, in a much easier way. It's good at providing fairness. And actually, providing fairness uh, can improve performance because you get better utilization of the cores. Sometimes, it's not always the case, though, because if you're, if you're fair, you lose memory bandwidth as well sometimes. So this is not a given. What are the downsides? It's always good to be critical and figure out what the downsides are. And you guys are good at that. There must be a downside with this. Yes? That's, a, that's actually a good one. Maybe I don't have it here. But determining that threshold to maximize performance is not that easy. You're right. Because it does depend on different applications and different workloads. Yes? Also, some processes have uh, higher priority. Yeah. They should probably be much more uh, That's right. So I did not discuss that. But what you can do is the paper discusses that. The way you can do it is you can scale the slowdowns with the priority of the thread. So you can communicate the priority of the thread. And if the thread is high priority, it will appear as if it has been slowed down a lot to the memory controller. Uh, to, uh, to, yeah, to the memory controller. So you can actually do that. And that's, that's a great idea. So you've got two of those that I don't have here, I think. Yes? You're basically penalizing a streaming application. You're penalizing a streaming application. So that's actually a, a Good point. That's the problem with time sharing, right? <laughs> You're really sharing, well, it's not time sharing, sharing some resources. Uh, that's right, yes. Uh, but you're doing this at the expense of the system, uh, at, at the benefit of the system performance, yes. Um, fairness may not be uh, like which thread accesses memory more or that. Mm -hmm. That's right, exactly. So this doesn't do that. You're right. So this, uh, this tries to balance the slowdowns, but it doesn't look at the overall effect of a request on the entire system. So if a thread is generating a request once in a blue moon, maybe you just want to service it so that it doesn't inter interfere with any other thread. And we're going to solve that problem in the later schedulers that we'll see. OK. Well, I guess it doesn't have, you, you guys said all, everything that I don't have on the slide, which is good. Because I, this, these are not meant to be exclu uh, comprehensive. You can always find downsides, and that's always a good thing to do. So this doesn't handle all types of interference, as we will see in the next scheduler. 
Uh, it's actually complex to implement. I can, I can remove this somewhat, probably. Uh, you, can, uh, you can approximate a lot of these things that I described, but the real difficulty is this, how do you determine the stall time excess? And that's very tough. You can approximate some of the divisions and, uh, with lookup tables, but this is very hard to get correct. In a sense, we re what we're really doing is we're trying to emulate what would have happened if the thread were running alone. And doing that perfectly requires the implementation of, well, basically emulating in hardware uh, as if the thread was running alone. And that's very complex. DRAM controls are already complex as we discussed, right? And we're adding more complexity to it. And slowdown estimations can be incorrect uh, because of this. And uh, my student, Lawai, has a lot of results showing that these slowdown estimations are very incorrect across uh, a large number of workloads. Her recent paper shows that you get 30% incorrectness in the slowdown estimations. And her mechanism, her current mechanism, uh, gets uh, estimations that are within 8% of the perfect estimation. But we will not go into that right now. If you're interested, you can read that. OK, so let's move on to the next thing. So we realize that this is too complex. So we'll try to fix the problem. This is the next work. I should assign this work, actually. But <laughs> because that, uh, as Yungu and Justin know, these are probably, this is my favorite paper. <laughs> Weren't you the one who suggested we should frame ParBS and do something about it? <laughs> OK. We should probably come up with a better name, though. BS doesn't sound too well. <laughs> but, <laughs> OK. So what's the idea here? So you've already seen that processors try to tolerate memory requests by generating many requests in parallel so that you can get overlapping of their latencies, right? This is the concept of memory level parallelism. And we've talked about out-of-order execution, non-blocking caches to support it. And we'll talk about run rate execution later on. This is effective only if the DRAM system actually services those requests in parallel, right? The processor may generate many requests in parallel, but if they're all going to the same bank, well, too bad, right? You cannot overlap their latencies. Now, let's assume that they're all going to different banks. We have enough banks. We have looked at that problem earlier. Even if that's the case, uh, they may get serialized because multiple threads share the DRAM controller, right? And DRAM controllers are not aware of a thread's MLP. They can service each thread's requests serially and not in parallel. Let's take a look at why this happens. Let's say we have two banks. We have a single thread, thread A, that generates two requests at the same time. It waits for those two requests. Thread, uh, the first request uh, goes to bank zero. The second request goes to bank one. The memory controller picks those requests and schedules them uh, in a pipeline manner. And these two requests are serviced in the banks in parallel. And later, they go back to the core, and the core can continue computation. Bank access latencies of the two requests are overlapped in this case, and the thread stalls approximately for one bank access latency. Let's take a look at what happens if you run two of these same threads. Well, you're going to replicate the threads and put them on different cores. Both of these threads uh, generate two DRAM requests at approximately the same time. Now, let's assume that the requests arrive in this order. The memory controller first takes thread A's request to bank 0 and schedules it. And then it takes thread B's request to bank 1 and schedules it. And during this time, both of the threads wait for these requests. They stall. This is the timeline. And then the memory controller finishes the first request. Uh, and then it schedules thread B's request to bank 0. And then it finishes the second request. It schedules thread A's request to bank 1. And both threads still continue waiting because both of the requests need to arrive for the threads to make progress. Right? They cannot continue, even though one request of each of the threads is done. And after a while, the bank, banks finish uh, the requests, and they send back the requests in a pipeline manner, and the threads can st uh, start computing again. In this case, what happened is bank access latencies of each thread is serialized. If you look at this, this request and this request are serialized, and similar here. Each thread stalls for approximately two bank access latencies instead of one. So they've lost the memory level parallelism, the benefits of, these gen the benefits of generating two DRAM requests in parallel. So can we do better? And the idea of a parallelism where a scheduler is to preserve the parallelism of different threads, uh, each thread's uh, parallelism. Let's take a look at what a parallelism where a scheduler would do. Uh, these requests arrive in the same order as I've shown earlier. The memory controller takes uh, thread A's request to bank 0, schedules it. And then even though the next request in age order may be thread B's request to bank 1, it realizes that thread A has another request to bank 1. And it picks that request to preserve thread A's parallelism. And thread A's request gets serviced in bank 0 and bank 1. Both threads stall because none of their requests are done yet. 
And later, thread A's request to bank zero gets done. Thread B's request to bank zero gets scheduled. Thread A's request to bank one gets done. Now thread B's request to bank one gets scheduled out of order, out of arrival order. But now what happened was both requests of thread A went back to the core and the thread A can continue computation. Thread B still needs to stall because its requests are being serviced. But after some point, if its requests are done, it can compute also. What happened is we've saved a lot of cycles because we preserved the parallelism of thread A and overlapped the latencies such that those requests arrived earlier. And this improves system throughput because the average stall time here is one and a half bank access latencies, approximately, uh, instead of two. So that's the idea. Preserving the parallelism improves performance. And we'd like to do that. So how do you, uh, what, what did we do, basically? There are two principles here. One principle I've already told you, uh, which is parallelism awareness. If you schedule a request from a thread uh, to different banks back to back, you actually preserve the parallelism of that thread. Right? Now, if you do this, if you keep on doing this, this can cause starvation, right? Because as you schedule the request of a thread to different banks, the thread may be generating more requests as it progresses. And we would like to uh, ensure that this doesn't happen. So the second principle is we batch the request so that this parallelism awareness is contained within some number of requests in the memory system. The idea is to group a fixed number of oldest requests from each thread into a batch and service the batch before all other requests. And you form a new batch when the current one is done. So this is a very old idea, actually. Remember, I told you that I'll tell you a little bit about disk scheduling. This was actually employed in disks in the 1960s. Basically, disks uh, batched requests from different programs and finished that batch before moving on to the other batch. And the reason they did that was uh, a streaming access is very fast in disks, especially if, you, if the access is uh, the next thing the head will touch. Right? Whereas if you want to move the head to uh, somewhere far away in a random place, it takes a lot of time. So you would like to exploit those streaming accesses. You would like to schedule the accesses that are going to be touched by the head next earlier than everything else. But if you do this greedily, then what happens is you'll actually starve some threats. So you would like to do this within a batch. That's essentially what we're doing. We didn't come up with a new idea here. In fact, if you look at the paper, there's a paper by Frank in 1967 that describes how disks do it. But this is a way of ensuring that you don't starve the system. And it's a nice way, I think. So it's just eliminates starvation, provides some sort of fairness. It also allows this parallelism awareness uh, to be employed within a batch. Let me demonstrate this pictorially to you. Let's say we have two banks and four different threads. Each of them have two different requests. Uh, the memory controller looks at its queue and forms a batch. And the key is the memory controller doesn't delay any request to form the batch. Because memory is so slow and the processors are so fast, you already have this queue of requests waiting at the memory. So you can form a batch by just looking at what you already have in your request buffer. So we're not delaying things. Although that's another design decision that you might want to consider at some point, right? You actually delay to form the batch. And we'll see, we, we probably won't see that, but we're looking into that right now. So the memory controller forms a batch, and in the, each batch, it first takes thread zero's requests and serves them in parallel. In the meantime, other requests from thread two arrive, but they're not included in the batch. Otherwise, we'll have starvation. Then the memory controller takes thread one's requests and schedules them in parallel. Then it takes thread two's requests and schedules them in parallel. Then it takes, and note that thread two's requests that are outside the batch are not scheduled. So thread two will still be stalling. Then it takes thread three's request and scales them in parallel, and then it forms a new batch. And then it keeps going this way. It sounds like fun. Right? It's, a, it's a very regular scheduler now. Now, of course, how do you, how do you actually, the life is not that nice as I showed you over here. There are two components for PARBS, parallelism over batch scheduling, request batching and within batch scheduling. Request batching, how do you do this? Basically, you can tag each request with a bit mark bit, saying that it's part of the batch. How do you form the batch? There are many ways of doing this, but you can mark up to a marking cap oldest request per bank for each thread. And mark requests constitute the batch. You want to take the oldest request so that the thread can make progress. Right? Uh, and the memory control forms a new batch when no mark requests are left uh, in, in its queue. Mark requests are prioritized over unmarked ones. That's the idea of batching. There no there is no reordering of requests across batches. As a result, there is no starvation. And there is some sort of fairness, although we'll look at fairness in a little bit more detail soon. 
The key question is how do you prioritize requests that are within the batch? Now that we've formed the batch, what is the prioritization policy? What is the parallelism aware prioritization policy? You can actually use any existing DRAM scheduling policy to do this. So for example, you can use row hit first and then oldest first to exploit robo for locality within a batch. And batching still improves performance because it eliminates starvation caused by this. And you can see the paper for results. But we also want to preserve intra-thread bank parallelism, service each thread's request back to back. So how do we do that? Uh, the idea is to have the scheduler compute a ranking of threads. And this, again, is a fundamental principle. If you compute a ranking, now we can regularly serve the threads uh, when the batch is formed. Uh, higher ranked threads are prioritized over lower ranked ones. Uh, this improves the likelihood that requests from a thread are serviced in parallel by different banks, as I will show you in an example soon. Because different threads are prioritized in the same rank order across all banks. This is, you can imagine, again, this is the rank of soldiers, right? The, the memory, uh, all of the bank schedulers are doing the same thing, prioritizing uh, the threads in the same rank. So how do you do this computation of the ranking? That's a tough question. Uh, the ranking scheme actually affects both throughput and fairness. Uh, our goals, remember again, we would like to maximize system throughput and minimize unfairness. And I'll still use the definition of unfairness, equalize the slowdown of different threads. Uh, what is maximizing system throughput? As I showed you earlier, you would like to minimize the average stall time of threads within a batch, right? Uh, because if you minimize the average stall time, hopefully, that, uh, hopefully the system throughput increases. If to minimize unfairness, uh, you would like to service the threads with inherently low stall time early in the batch. These are more memory uh, non-intensive threads. This goes back to what you said, for example. If a thread is not generating a lot of requests, uh, if you prioritize that, uh, you will not delay it a lot. If you uh, c consider two threads that are very different in terms of memory intensity, one has this much latency to memory. This is memory non-intensive, let's say. And this is intensive. Let's say it has this much latency to memory. If you delay them by the same amount, let's say that amount is this much, Which one gets slowed down more? Obviously, this one gets slowed down more, right? The slowdown for this is almost 2x in memory, versus for this, it's maybe, I don't know, 1.2x. So within a batch, you would like to prioritize this thread so that it doesn't get slowed down as much as the other one. And that's the uh, insight here. So it turns out, to achieve both of these, uh, you would like to use something like shortest stall time first or shortest job first ranking. Again, this is not uh, the first thing to discover, and you can improve upon this. Uh, shortest job first scheduling improves, uh, provides optimal system throughput in a single server queue. And this is an old paper that I would recommend uh, in 1956 uh, by Smith. Uh, this is not, now this is not a single server queue, Jung will tell me, because you have many different banks, but the approximation works. Uh, except we're, we're going to remove this optimality. We're not going to claim anything optimal. <laughs> okay. So the idea is to have the controller estimate each thread's stall time within the batch. So it estimates this portion within the batch with some approximations again. And rank the threads with shorter stall time higher. And the hope is that this will actually achieve both of these things. It will minimize average stall time as well as minimize unfairness. Let's take a look at how this works. So let me give you actually how this uh, is concretely implemented. The memory controller computes two values for each thread. One is the maximum number of mark requests to any bank, max bank load of the thread. And it will rank the thread with lower max bank load higher. So this is going to be used to approximate low stall time, the stall time of the thread. And as a tiebreaker, it will compute total number of mark requests, which is the total load of the thread within the batch. And we'll use that as a tiebreaker. And we'll rank the thread with lower total load higher, assuming that lower total load, again, corresponds to a lower intensity. So let's take a look at a more complicated example, which doesn't consider row buffers, but an even more complicated example is actually in the paper. Uh, we have four different threads again and four banks. Let's compute the max bank load and total load of all these th threads. Let's take a look at thread zero first. What is max bank load? This is the maximum number of mark requests to any bank. So we look at these three requests, and the maximum number of requests is one to any bank, right? And the total load is three. Let's look at thread one. Thread one has maximum number of requests to any bank, 
bank zero has two requests. That's the maximum number. So its max bank load is two and total load is four. Thread two has the maximum number of requests it has to any bank is two to bank one and bank two. So its max bank load is six, total, uh, two, total load is six. And finally, thread three, you got the idea. The maximum number of requests it has to any bank is one, two, three, four, five, bank three, and its total load is nine. So now we have our ranking. Thread zero is ranked higher than thread one, ranked higher than thread two, and ranked higher than thread three. Right? Now let's take a look at the within batch. Let's assume that this is our batch. Right? We've already formed the batch. Let's look at how much better parallelism aware scheduling would do compared to the baseline. And baseline, we'll assume that we'll have our arrival order. And I'll make gross simplifications here. We're not considering the bus here, just the bank latencies. And these are the times at which different requests are scheduled. If you look at time one, these requests are scheduled in parallel. Time two, these requests are scheduled in parallel. Let's compute how much stall time each thread has according to the scheduling order. Uh, thread zero, its last request is serviced after time four, so that's its stall time. Thread one's last request is serviced after time four also, its stall time is four. Thread two's last request is serviced after time five, so its stall time is five. Thread three's last request is serviced after time seven, so its stall time is seven. And if you compute the average stall time, you get five bank access latencies. And we're ignoring all the buses uh, and address, uh, address and command buses, as well as the data bus latency. But uh, you will see that those are all modeled. So what is the scheduling order with parallelism or batch scheduling? We've already computed the rank, right? Ranking, thread zeros, requests are scheduled over thread ones, over thread twos, over thread threes. So if you look at this, thread zeros requests are scheduled first. So they're all parallel in the different banks. And last request is serviced after one access latencies. Thread ones requests are scheduled next or prioritized next. As a result, they're scheduled like this. So it's like uh, filling uh, the bricks, right? It's like Tetris, playing Tetris. You uh, fill, the, fill the different parts. Uh, it's called bin packing also. And <laughs> you're packing the bins with the th different threads. So thread one's last request gets uh, serviced after two access latencies. Thread two is prioritized next. Its last request gets serviced after four access latencies. And thread three is prioritized the least. So its uh, stall time is seven in this case. So if you look at this, the average is 300 bank access latency. So we saved 30% in terms of bank access latency in terms of stall time. Now th remember that this is within a batch. So the overall performance improvements will probably not be this high because you have batching employed on this. So that's the benefit of ranking, making a memory scheduler very regular that preserves the parallelism. And if you look at this, thread zero's parallelism is perfectly preserved. Right? Thread one's parallelism also perfectly preserved because this bank conflict you cannot parallelize anyway. Thread two's parallelism, I believe, is also perfectly preserved. So I, I picked a great example here. You can come up with much <laughs> something that actually exercises this in a bad way too, probably. But uh, you got the idea. OK, so how do you actually design the scheduling policy? Well, uh, the scheduling policy is it prioritizes mark request first. This is a batching component. And the ranking component is incorporated here. And you can argue with me which one is actually better. Uh, the second uh, prioritization order is row hit requests are prioritized first. And the third, order is, the third uh, prioritization order is higher rank threads are prioritized first. This incorporates parallelism awareness. And there's a, a tension. There's always a tension between parallelism and locality in systems. And there's a tension here. Do you want to prioritize row hit requests first, or do you want to prioritize uh, higher rank threads first? And this turns out uh, it's, it's not easy to achieve the perfect answer. So if you flip the order between two and three, you get similar results. But I think going forward, maybe you have a better mechanism to exploit this. And I don't know what the answer is there. Uh, row hit request minimizes the latency. Uh, this maximizes the overlap. Right. OK, there are three properties, which I'm not going to in detail. This exploits both robo for locality and intra-thread bank parallelism. It's also work conserving. Are you guys familiar with work conserving schedulers? Yes? No? Yes, some of you. If you've taken an operating system class, probably yes. But basically, it services unmarked requests to banks without marked requests. You don't delay. You don't waste bandwidth, basically. If you have available bandwidth, you use it, which may or may not be a good thing always, uh, because there may be another request that comes in uh, that needs that bandwidth, and that's more critical. Except in our case, it's not the case, right? Because we say that batching, a batch is prioritized over everything else. 
And if there are no mark requests uh, to a bank, you might as well just schedule it. Right? There, is no, there is no point in wasting that bandwidth because you're not going to increase the size of the batch. The batch is formed, and it's not going to change. Although you can look at the paper and there are design options. What happens if you actually increase the size of the batch later on? Well, now you lose some of these nice properties of batching because you can keep adding new stuff into the batch, and now you lose the starvation freedom guarantees of batching. OK, so, uh, that's the idea of work conservation. So marking cap is important, and I'll let you read the paper. If you actually, well, maybe I'll briefly describe it. If you have a too small cap, you have a very small batch. Imagine you get only one request from each thread to each bank to be included in the batch. Can you exploit robo for locality with that? Probably not, right? Yeah. Because now uh, you rank the threads and you switch to another thread because you, don't you have only at most one request from each thread. So too, you don't want too small a cap. If you have too large of a cap, then what happens is you incorporate, let's say, 10 requests from each thread to each bank. If there's a memory intensive thread, now that thread hogs, uh, you need to service 10 of those requests first uh, of that thread before you can service a memory non-intensive thread that's not included in the batch. So it may be that that's one of the downsides of batching any request, right? If you actually ha have a uh, large number of requests in the batch, what if you have a request coming in from a memory non-intensive thread? This is the only request that this thread generates in a while, again, once in a blue moon. And it's so unlucky that it doesn't get included in the batch because the batch is huge. So it needs to wait for this batch to drain first. So this is a memory non-intensive thread. If you want to improve system performance, you would really like to prioritize it. But batching is, not, is rigid. It doesn't do that. So we'll fix this problem in the next scheduler that we will cover, hopefully. So ideally, you would like to have a solution to that. But batching has that problem. And too large cap actually exacerbates that problem. So this is actually a tough thing to, whenever you have a threshold like this, it's tough to get the threshold perfectly right. OK, so what is the hardware cost of all this? You can read the paper, but this is much more implementable than what I described to you earlier, stall time for memory scheduling. That's the storage cost. But more than the storage cost, uh, complexity is less. No, there, there are no complex operations. There are no divisions here. And you don't need to estimate the slowdowns. In a sense, we're kind of using the shortest stall time as a proxy for the slowdowns. Right? Not exactly. but. And it's not on the critical path. The scheduler makes a decision only every DRAM cycle. So you can ask me, what is the performance of this? I'll briefly give you an idea. This is the unfairness. Actually, unfairness, lower is better. Uh, this is maximum memory slowdown divided by the minimum memory slowdown. And this is a four-core system uh, with some workloads, eight-core and 16-core systems. And these are different schedulers. First ready, first come, first serve is a row hit first scheduler. So it's very unfair, of course, the large number of workloads. First come, first serve fixes that problem for, some, for the four-core system a little bit. But it becomes unfair as you increase the number of cores. Right? Because there are some, uh, first come, first serve doesn't exploit the row buffer uh, very well. Right? It doesn't do row hit first scheduling. But it's still unfair because it prioritizes memory non intensive threads over memory intensive threads, exactly the opposite of what we would like to do. Right? And NFQ, uh, this is actually a fair queuing based memory controller, which also uh, has issues. I will not go into that in detail, but network switches, routers actually employ fair queuing mechanisms. Uh, to solve similar issues, similar problems, to allocate bandwidth proportion, uh, bandwidth, uh, not proportionally, but well, you could call it proportionally, fairly to different streams. You could employ the same techniques in memory, except memory is a little bit different. It has banks, right? Whereas a network link is a single link. And this is stall time for memory scheduling and parallelism memory batch scheduling. So if you look at this, uh, parallelism memory batch scheduling achieves the best uh, unfairness value. Lower is better in this case. Ideally, you would like to have one. In terms of system performance, parallel memory batch scheduling improves system performance as well. Uh, and you can read the paper for this. There are two reasons. One is improving fairness actually improves performance, as I told you earlier. The second is preserving bank level parallelism also improves performance, improves each thread's performance, and you get better performance. OK, what are the upsides of this? I think I give, yes? Those things you just said. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Yeah, it basically addresses bank parallelism destruction across multiple threads, right? Uh, 
It's a simple mechanism versus STFM. There could be other simpler mechanisms. Batching provides fairness, and ranking enables parallelism awareness. And these are two fundamental substrates you can use in any scheduler that you design in the future. Actually, operating system schedulers can use similar concepts too, but we won't go into that. Downsides, uh, if you uh, think about how to do this in a multiple memory controller system. In today's systems, uh, or going forward, we'll have more scalable systems, and you can have multiple memory controllers. In fact, we already have multiple memory controllers, but a more scalable system may, for example, have cores and caches interconnected in some manner. Okay, I'll interconnect them somehow. You can interconnect them in your head. But let's say you have four different memory controllers. And they all receive requests from different threads. And the question is, do each of these memory controllers do the batching and the ranking independently? Or do they coordinate with each other? Now, if they don't coordinate with each other, what happens if a thread has 10 requests here versus only one request here? It'll be ranked much higher here and much lower here. And they'll make decisions that are not coordinated with each other. As a result, you may not get the best performance. You may not want to prioritize this thread here, right? There might be other threads that have only one request here, or maybe two requests here. So you need some coordination between these different controllers. And I will not go into this deta in detail. So this becomes harder with parallelism or batch scheduling because the batches are formed by looking at the request queues of the controllers. Right? And they may have very, very different mixes of requests in the controllers in the short term. You can communicate the rankings to a central controller, and the central controllers can say, OK, use this ranking based on everything I see from all of you. Now, that leads to a lot of communication, because if you do these batches, it's about uh, a batch gets completed about 2, 000, uh, every 2,000 to 5,000 cycles. That's a lot of communication that you really don't want. So the idea here, which is described in the Atlas paper, which is written by Yungu and us, uh, uh, the idea is to actually do this uh, batching. I will call it batching. It's really not batching at a coarse grain. Uh, Granularity. Don't, you don't do this every 2,000 or 5,000 cycles, but you do it at the granularity of 10 million. And you look at the memory intensity of the threads. You look at how much service each thread attains from the memory system to different memory controllers and prioritize the thread that has attained the least service. Uh, with least attained service. What does attained service mean? If a request of a thread is scheduled, it's attain, it attains service. That thread attains service. You, so you, count, you increase the service count for that thread. If a thread has attained the smallest amount of service, figure that out at a, lo a long time interval, like 10 million cycles, and tell each controller to prioritize that thread. Compute the ranking that way. Now, this way, you prioritize these latency-sensitive threads or memory non-intensive threads because memory non-intensive threads probably are not attaining a lot of service from the memory system. But memory intensive threads, because just because of the sheer number of requests they have, they'll attain a lot of service from the memory system. That's the idea. And actually, a lot of the operating system schedulers have used this in the past. But I'll not go into this detail uh, in detail. If you can look at the Atlas memory scheduler, and I have some slides later on. Or you can talk to Jung about it. This was published in HPCA 2010. And this is actually a relatively simple scheduler to implement. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, right? Is that, enough? is that fine enough, though? That's right. That's, that's a, a 10 million level. That's right. The, the downside of this is it doesn't look into fairness. Yeah, exactly. yeah this is purely for performance. And Jung, uh, I'll talk about Jungo's next work, which actually incorporates both. So, Keep this in mind. This is actually simple to implement because you just have a attain service counter per thread. That's it. None of this uh, stall, uh, shortest stall time computation. So it may be good to implement if you actually find a way of providing fairness here. So what is the problem with fairness here? Well, uh, threads uh, uh, th that have attained a lot of service now get delayed a lot, right, in the middle because uh, they're, they're going to be deprioritized for a long time. OK. So what is the other downside of PARBS? It doesn't always prioritize latency-sensitive applications, right? Latency-sensitive meaning 
uh, memory not intensive, right? If you generate one request once in a blue moon, you're latency sensitive. You want, you want that request to be serviced. Right? Uh, and this actually solves that problem a little bit. Now, if you generate requests once in a blue moon, your attain service is very low, and you'll be prioritized right away. This solves that problem, but it doesn't solve the fairness problem. OK. So how can we get the best of both worlds? How can we get both performance as well as fairness? Uh, this is Jungo's work. Maybe he should be presenting here. But <laughs> maybe he prefers to sleep in the back so that <laughs> he catches up on doing more research on memory scheduling. <laughs> uh, if you look at these schedulers, uh, and uh, uh, look at, uh, categorize them in terms of the system throughput they provide and the fairness they provide. Uh, let's take a look at what they look like. This is, these are results across a number of workloads, almost 100 workloads, on a 24-core system with four memory controllers. And this is better system throughput as you go from left to right. We'll defer the discussion of how you uh, evaluate the system throughput uh, of a multi-program workload for later. And the y-axis is uh, better fairness as you go from top to bottom. And here, the fairness is defined as maximum slowdown. This is the, remember, before I told you that uh, max divided by min, that's actually not a great metric for fairness, and we can discuss that later. But maximum slowdown is a better metric, because if your maximum slowdown is low in general, you, get a, you have a, better fair, a more fair system. So ideally, we would like to be here. Right? High throughput, high fairness. This is Atlas. Atlas has a system throughput bias because it prioritized the least attained service uh, scheduler. This is Power BS. It has a fairness bias because it's not as high performance as Atlas, but it's more fair. This is stall time fair memory scheduler, which is not good for anything anymore. Uh, and this is first ready, first come, first serve, which is the row hit first scheduling policy employed by many existing schedulers or most existing schedulers. And this is actually first come, first serve. If you do not do any scheduling, it's actually, it actually got lucky here, I think. Right, Yungu? Because <laughs> it's, it's good in terms of fairness for some reason. But it may be because of the workloads that you have here. Uh, so no previous scheduling algorithm. This is where you would like to be. Right? No previous scheduling algorithm provides both the best fairness and system throughput. The question is, how do we achieve best of both worlds? And usually, whenever you want to achieve best of both worlds, as I told you in an earlier class, heterogeneity is a very good answer. Right? And we'll actually design a heterogeneous or asymmetric scheduling policy. And uh, the components will be throughput biased approach and fairness biased approach together. What is the throughput biased approach? If you want to improve system throughput, you would like to prioritize memory non-intensive uh, threads, and which means that uh, prioritize less memory intensive threads. Uh, if you look at threads this way, less memory intensive threads are given higher priority here. As a result, thread A makes progress in its core. It's fast, so system utilization improves. But thread C now starves. This poor thread doesn't get its request service. And this problem is, becomes especially important, uh, especially bad, if you have many threads in front of thread C. Right? Maybe just a little bit smaller threads, just a little bit less, uh, less memory intensive. So we don't want this for fairness. If you want to be purely fair, and you could argue what fair means exactly, and that's been a discussion for decades in computing, but I'll give you one uh, way of actually reasonably thinking about fairness. You would like to have threads take turns ac accessing memory. Right? For a while, thread C accesses memory. For a while, thread A. For a while, thread B. And you'd like them to take turns, be prioritized in these turns. This, as a result, thread C does not start because when its turn comes, it can inject its request. But thread A is not prioritized now. Its throughput is reduced. Right? In a sense, you can think of. Uh, uh, stall time fair memory scheduling mapping to this policy a little bit. Not exactly. Basically, this is a round robin scheduling. Right. So this leads to reduced throughput. So the realization Jungu made a single policy for all threads is basically insufficient. So we'd like to have a, a heterogeneous policy uh, to achieve the best of both worlds. For throughput, we would like to prioritize memory non-intensive threads. These threads are small. Prioritizing them doesn't hurt the other ones, but significantly improves system throughput. For fairness, unfairness is actually caused by these memory intensive threads being prioritized over each other, not because of these small threads that once in a blue moon generate requests being prioritized over others. So we'd like to handle unfairness that happens between these threads, because that's the uh, one that reduces the fairness significantly. So why don't we shuffle the thread ranking once in a while in the system? Remember the ranking? We rank threads. Instead of 
having a rigid ranking, which is based on memory intensity, perhaps, which how Atlas operates, or which is how uh, parallel memory batch scheduling operates within a batch, we shuffle this ranking once in a while so that you get fair uh, uh, access to memory from these different threads. And uh, I'm not going into this in detail, but memory intensive threads have different vulnerability to interference, so you can make this shuffling asymmetric also. Some, some threads are uh, more vulnerable to being delayed, whereas some threads are less vulnerable to being delayed. For example, if you have good bank level parallelism, if you're delayed significantly in one bank, you're more vulnerable to being delayed. Any, any request that goes to any bank will delay you and significantly reduce your performance. Whereas if you have bad bank level parallelism, you're less vulnerable to that. You can read the paper uh, for that. But that's the idea. For throughput, you do this. For fairness, you do shuffling. Prioritize memory non-intensive thread for throughput. Uh, shuffle the thread ranking for fairness. And you can shuffle asymmetrically. Uh, so how does this work? The memory controller groups the threads into two clusters. You take all the threads in the system, figure out which ones are memory non-intensive, which ones are memory intensive. You have a non-intensive cluster and you have an intensive cluster. And we prioritize the non-intensive cluster over the intensive cluster for throughput. And we employ different policies within the, each cluster uh, for fairness as well as throughput. So if you look at the intensive cluster, uh, the thread ranking is shuffled in the intensive cluster for fairness. And this improves fairness. If you look at the memory non-intensive cluster, you prioritize the threads that are less intensive over others, which improves throughput. So how do you do the clustering? I'll briefly give you the ideas. Basically, memory control sorts threads by their misses per kilo instruction, how many requests they have generated per instruction. And it computes a total memory bandwidth usage for those threads within some time interval. And it figures out uh, the memory bandwidth usage of alpha t and divides the threads into two clusters based on those threads that have used alpha times t. Those will be the non-intensive cluster. So it's basically a threshold. And whenever you have a threshold, you have robustness problems, as we've discussed. And that will be the problem with this scheduler. But it, uh, it works. So you can have alpha, uh, you can set alpha to be less than 10%. Basically, the threads that use less than 10% of the memory bandwidth are deemed to be the non-intensive cluster. Because they're supposed to be threads that are not intensive. They're not using a lot of memory bandwidth. That's the idea. And the rest is the intensive cluster. So how does this work? We have a quantum-based scheme. Memory controller looks at the previous quantum. And during the quantum, it monitors thread behavior, memory intensity. I didn't tell you about this, bank level parallelism and over for locality, but this is needed for asymmetric shuffling to figure out the different vulnerabilities of the threads to uh, interference. At the beginning of the quantum, the memory controller performs clustering and computes the niceness of the threads, which I did not talk about. And within the quantum, it uses these small shuffling intervals to shuffle the thread ranking. And the idea is to be fair in this case. That's how we get the fairness uh, in, the, in the memory intensive cluster. So what is the scheduling algorithm? Now that you've, uh, you've had these, uh, uh, you, you computed these values, it's relatively simple. Highest rank threads are prioritized first. Requests from higher rank threads are prioritized. And highest rank means non-intensive cluster is greater than, uh, higher rank than the intensive cluster. And within the non-intensive cluster, lower intensive threads are higher ranked. Within the intensive cluster, ranks are shuffled once in a while. So they keep changing. So every thread gets some chance to access memory because of that shuffling. Uh, access memory in a prioritized way. OK, and the next priority order is row hit first. We still want to uh, preserve uh, robo for locality. And the next priority level is oldest, oldest first. Older requests are prioritized over others. So what are the results? I've shown you these different mechanisms. These are previous works. And TCM sits right here. So it improves throughput as well as fairness compared to the best previous schedulers. So now you can achieve the best of both worlds. And the idea is, again, you incorporate heterogeneity to achieve the best of both worlds. Remember, heterogeneity, uh, we discussed it at the multi-core context also, right? I see this very similar to other design principles that you make. You have a large core and a bunch of small cores. And if you want to achieve high parallel performance as well as high serial performance, you want something heterogeneous like this. That's essentially what we're doing here at the policy level. We're not designing different cores, but we're designing different policies 
for these different uh, parts, uh, different threads that have different demands. Okay. So there's another benefit to this, which is actually you can vary this configuration parameter, which is the cluster threshold. And uh, what you get is a predictable throughput per, uh, fairness curve. So if you look at the past policies, they have configuration parameters. So I told you about stall time fair memory scheduling, right? If you vary that alpha threshold, maximum tolerable unfairness threshold, this is what you get in terms of the throughput and fairness curve. It's kind of unpredictable, right? You don't actually change. You significantly change the fairness you get, but you don't get the change the throughput you get significantly. Of course, this is within reasonable bounds. If you make the uh, unfairness threshold one, uh, you can put STFM in a very, uh, uh, in a state that keeps basically switching between policies a lot. And that could be a nice exam question, by the way. <laughs> uh, and if you can actually change the FRFCFS policy, FRFCFS policy is not that rigid. You can prioritize row hit requests over others, as I said, right? But many, uh, when we actually presented the STFM work, I think this is public now, uh, uh, engineers from AMD came and they said they don't implement the FRFCFS policy purely. What they have is they have a way of capping the number of reorderings that happen. And the idea, we had that actually in the paper uh, at that time. That was something we compared to. Uh, what you can do is you can say, I'm not going to reorder more than n requests uh, and schedule them out of order. Because that, that is what leads to starvation because of the row buffer. Uh, uh, of the row buffer. So if you vary that parameter of how much reordering you can do, you can reorder only one request over the oldest request. You can reorder only two requests over the oldest request, dot, 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 n requests. That's what you get with the FRFCFS policy. And it's not a nice curve. PARVS, again, you can change the marking cap, and this is the curve you get. Atlas, uh, this is the curve you get. What parameter did you change here? This was the interval. In Atlas, there is no cluster threshold. <laughs> Interval, yes, that's probably true. Yeah. And TCM, if you change the cluster threshold, this is what you get. Of course, within reasonable bounds again. So you get a Pareto uh, optimal curve here, right? That uh, you can actually pick any of these depending on what you want to maximize, fairness or performance. Right? So it's, it gives you a predictable fairness performance uh, trade-off. And ideally, you would like to design mechanisms like this that, that are more controllable than others. OK, now I've given you a TCM, which is better than sliced bread, right? <laughs> which is really not. So there are some upsides. I'll give you the upsides. It provides both high fairness and high performance, at least for these workloads. And that's the key. It caters to the needs of different types of threads, perhaps more importantly. If you're latency sensitive, you can go into the latency sensitive cluster. If you're bandwidth intensive, you can go into the bandwidth intensive or bandwidth sensitive cluster. Right? And it's relatively simple, although not as simple as Atlas, right? That is one counter per thread. What are the downsides? There must be some. No? Perfect. That's not true for anything, right? <laughs> Well, this is, maybe you haven't thought of this, but scalability of large buffer size is a problem with many of these schedulers. And with TCM, it's a problem also. As you scale to large buffer size and large number of threads also, actually, which is implied by large buffer sizes, is two clusters enough? That's not a clear question. And actually, more importantly, I think these two things are coupled. What is the robustness of these clustering and shuffling algorithms? Whenever you have a threshold cl to cluster threads and latency sensitive and bandwidth sensitive, what happens to a thread that's right in the middle? If you actually put it into the latency sensitive cluster, it gets deprioritized all the time. If you put it into the bandwidth intensive cluster, bandwidth sensitive cluster, now it's less intensive than everything else over there. Everything else will deprioritize it. So now you have a problem, right? So this actually ha is not very robust. And that's one of the reasons why it's not very scalable as well. So uh, what are the solutions to this? Well, the problem actually comes from the rigidity of memory uh, clustering. Right? 
whenever you cluster things, you have some rigidity. One solution could be, for example, you may decide that thread belongs to the uh, latent sensitive cluster in one interval. In the next interval, you put it in the bandwidth sensitive cluster. That might be good, but it's not exactly perfect because it gets deprioritized in both cases, right? So that doesn't work. So I'll let you think about some solutions. But going forward, and I will not cover some of these solutions, uh, going forward, whenever you have robustness problems, it's important to design mechanisms that are not affected by robustness. And a lot of the probabilistic mechanisms are not affected by robustness. If you flip a coin once in a while and prioritize that thread, and if you flip coins differently for different threads, they get their share. They get their uh, uh, equivalent share. The idea is called lottery scheduling. And I'll encourage you to read the paper. I'll not go into detail. But let's assume that each thread has some share. How do you enforce those shares? You flip that coin. And with some probability, you service that request of that thread. This is by Carl Waltzberger. His thesis was actually on this. And I, I believe this was an OSDI 1994. So you can take a look at that paper. But I'm not, uh, you can think about applications to memory scheduling, but I'll not uh, cover this uh, more. Let's see how much time we have. There are other ways of handling interference too, but uh, I wonder if we should continue or uh, we should take a break. Do you guys want a break? No? <laughs> no, none of you want breaks. <laughs> OK. Wow. <laughs> you do want to cover this, or do you want to uh, leave the podium to Dr. Strecker? It's your choice. I can cover a little bit more and, and then go. <laughs> no choice. <laughs> you would like this? <laughs> OK, maybe I'll cover other ways of handling quickly, and then I'll uh, uh, Dr. Strecker will be our guest. <laughs> OK, uh, there are other ways of handling interference. We, we actually took a very deep dive into memory scheduling. And these are not the most state-of-the-art algorithms now. If you'd like to learn more, you can talk with my students. But a lot of the ideas actually here are going into processors right now. For example, some of the batching ideas are implemented in existing processors. Uh, and I cannot tell you which ones exactly, but uh, some of the principles that are actually simple are going into the processors. Because this is a problem, and this problem will go it will become much more important in the future as we put more cores on chip and memory bandwidth, uh, as memory bandwidth is not increasing. But we would like to look at other ways of handling interference as well. And they're actually, and so the, our goal is really to reduce and control interference. And there are really four fundamental techniques to do this. And if you find one more, then you get an extra credit on something, probably. I've talked to you about prioritization or request scheduling. Right? That's one way. You prioritize one thread over the other. And you can reduce interference. You can preserve the parallelism. Or you can control interference, as we did in STFM. Second is you can map the data to different banks, channels, and ranks differently, right? And this one other fundamental way. If you have different banks, ensure that thre uh, threads that are interfering badly with each, other, with each other go to different banks so that they don't get bank conflicts with each other. Or channels, even better, right? That's the idea. You can throttle the sources or cores, right? Instead of trying to prioritize them, if you get a very memory intensive thread, tell that to stop for a while. You're disturbing everyone else. Right? That could be one uh, way of doing this. And I'll briefly go over some of the techniques. And finally, well, if you have the option, you can schedule the threads that do not interfere with each other together on uh, uh, cores that share the memory resources. Right? If you have this option, of course. If you have a big pool of threads and you're deciding out of, a, out of 50 threads, two threads to pick on a two-core system, you'd ideally want to pick threads that go well together, that do not destroy each other in the memory system. And I haven't found the fifth one yet, but <laughs> I'd be open to thinking about it. So let's briefly take a look at these three different options, actually two different options. I will not go into this in detail. Memory channel partitioning. This is one of my students, Lawanya, did uh, this work. The idea here is very simple. Figure out what if in applications are badly interfering with each other and map their pages to different channels. So if you look at this cooked up example, we have core 0 executing application A and core B executing application B. And we have two different channels. And these are the requests that come from core, the red ones are the requests that come from core 0. Blue ones are the requests that come from core 1. Uh, 
core one's requests get delayed significantly behind core zero's request because they are mapped to the same channel. Right? Now, if you separated these applications, well, it's nice. Core one can make progress significantly. Right? Now, this is a cooked up example because now you have one application per channel. Right? In the future, this is not the case. You'll maybe, well, today, for example, Tylera has a system with 64 cores on four memory controllers. So you cannot do that. Or even Intel right now has eight cores uh, and three memory controllers, and my knowledge may be out of date. They're fast, they're growing fast. So the idea is, so here I show you that you can separate the applications that, are, that have low intensity and high intensity, right? That's a, that's a fundamental thing. You would like these low intensity applications to make progress. So if you group all of them to the same channel, they'll make fast progress. If you group the high intensity applications to their own channel, they're, they're gonna make slow progress anyway. And we'll fix that problem also. Uh, and you would like to separate in applications that have low, low robo for locality from high robo for locality. Because remember, if you have high robo for locality and if you have a memory controller that prioritizes in applications that have high robo for hit rate, you would like to separate these applications. This is random access versus streaming. That's the idea. Uh, it's especially effective in reducing interference of threads with medium and high heavy memory intensity. And I'll encourage you to read the paper. But the mechanism is this. You would like to profile the applications, classify applications into groups, partition the channels between application groups, and assign a preferred channel to, different, to each application, and allocate application pages at the operating system level to the preferred channel. This way, you don't need to modify the memory controller at all. The memory controller stays FRFCFS, first ready, first come, first serve. It's just the pages of applications get allocated differently to different uh, channels. So this can be done in hardware, and the rest can be done in system software. And you can read the paper. So one downside of this is, Applications that have very low memory intensity rarely access memory. These are the applications that generate requests once in a blue moon. Right? Dedicating channels to them actually results in precious memory bandwidth waste. You really don't want to do this. Right? You're underutilizing memory bandwidth, which is perhaps your most valuable resource in the future. Uh, but these applications have the most potential to keep their cores busy. We would really like to prioritize them. And, and they interfere minimally with other applications. Prioritizing them doesn't hurt others, as we've seen in thread cluster memory scheduling. So how do you do that? Well, it looks like my PowerPoint has a mind of its own. It's moving. Uh, but we would like to always prioritize very low memory intensity applications in the memory scheduler. This is called the integrated memory partitioning and scheduling. Figure out those applications that are not memory intensive and always prioritize them because they don't hurt others and they keep their cores busy. And we can use memory channel partitioning to mitigate interference between other applications. So again, we use different techniques to handle interference of different applications. You can view this as another heterogeneity uh, mechanism. Right? Prioritize the very low intensity applications in the memory scheduler. This doesn't hurt others. It's simple to do. And everything else, deal with memory channel partitioning. Now, I don't think I have upsides and downsides, but you can imagine what the upsides and downsides are. And that could be a nice question. That could be a nice question also. I'll give you one downside of partitioning, right? Partitioning is, page allocation is a decision that's costly. Right? You allocate a page in the operating system, and what if you made the wrong decision? You decide that this application is interfering with some other application, you've allocated its uh, page in one channel, whereas it should really have been in the other channel. Well, how do you change that decision? You only need to move that page from one channel to the other channel, right? That's a costly thing to do. We don't have easy mechanisms to move large chunks of data from one channel to another channel. So the decisions you make in clustering applications is uh, if you make an incorrect decision, it's a lot more costly in this case compared to memory scheduling. Because right? in memory scheduling, if you made the wrong decision, a few requests get prioritized over others, but you don't need to move data significantly. Okay, okay let's look at the, uh, another approach, alternative approach, which is source throttling. The idea here is we want to manage interference at the cores and not at the shared resources. So instead of, inter uh, instead of handling interference at the memory controller, actually let me, yeah, let's say this is the memory controller. Instead of handling interference here, you change the boundary of where you handle interference. And you can do it at the core level, right? Because cores can inject requests into the memory system and you throttle them appropriately so that they don't destroy each other's performance at the memory controller. That's the idea. So you change 
the level of abstraction, at least at the hardware case in this case, where you handle the interference. And one particular mechanism is uh, you can dynamically estimate unfairness in the memory system and feedback this information into a controller and throttle the core's memory access rates accordingly based on this unfairness information. Whom to throttle and by how much depends on performance target, throughput, fairness, per thread, quality of service, et cetera. And I'll encourage you to read the paper again. Uh, for example, if the unfairness in the system is greater than the system software specified target, then you can throttle down the core that's causing unfairness and throttle up the core that was unfairly treated. What does throttle down mean? Basically tell the core not to generate memory requests for a while, for example. Not, you can stop for 10,000 cycles. Uh, or you can, you can reduce the rate at which the requests are generated. Instead of stopping, you can say, OK, you can generate one request per n cycles or something like that. Or you can request at most n number of requests. And throttle up does the opposite. And this is described in this paper that was uh, in ASPLOS. Uh, so how does this work? Basically, it's an interval-based mechanism. Uh, each interval, uh, the system somehow estimates the slowdown of applications. And again, this is a key thing. How do you estimate the slowdown? Well, you somehow need to monitor what happens in the memory controller. You could do, for example, STFM, stall time for memory scheduling. Except you don't do the scheduling, but you monitor the slowdown. Uh, you estimate that unfairness, you find the application that has the highest slowdown, and you find the application that ha that's causing the most inf interference for that application. And at the end of the interval, you feed this information to a request throttling engine. If the unfairness estimate is greater than the target, it throttles down the application that's interfering. It, it limits the injection rate. It limits the number of requests outstanding in, per cycle. And you can throttle up the application that's the slowest so that now you can increase its request rate. This is one way of actually uh, doing it. There are many other ways, and I'll not go into detail again. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of this? The advantage, it's relatively easy to implement. No need to change the memory scheduling algorithm. And if you actually think about it, this is a general way of managing resources. Your resources are shared. It's not only the memory controller, but you have a shared cache as well. Right? You have a shared interconnect as well somewhere. If you manage the interference at the sources, you don't need to implement different mechanisms to, for quality of service in each of the resources. So that's the fundamental distinction between the source-based versus resource-based interference control. So you can have a much simpler mechanism, except you still need to figure out which threads are interfering badly with each other, right? And you could perhaps do that based on the request rates of the threads. But I'll not go into that in detail. Uh, the other advantage of this is, it can, well, I guess I already told you that, right? It can be a general way of handling shared resource contention. What is this advantage? Anybody can guess? Maybe I've gone through it really fast. It's actually a great mechanism, but there are bad disadvantages, I think, <laughs> even though we've looked at it and uh, written the paper uh, at ASPLOS. Well, one thing, OK. There's a bigger thing, which is related to the thresholds that I've been describing before. This requires a lot of thresholds to really optimize. And you can never get them right, I think. <laughs> Maybe they never is too strong, but it's very hard to get them right. So if you, for example, if you have a threshold uh, of, uh, let's say, how much to throttle, even that's a threshold, right? How much do you throttle a core that's interfering significantly with another one? If you make the wrong choice, if you say, I'm going to throttle it more than uh, that you really should have throttled, then you're losing throughput, right? Because that core is not making progress anymore. And those thresholds are very difficult to optimize, in my opinion. Uh, so coming up with better mechanisms of controlling the source throttling would be very nice, because it has a lot of promising sides, I think. OK, finally, application and thread scheduling. We would like to pick threads that do not badly interfere with each other. Uh, to be scheduled together. That's the idea. If you have a pool of threads, pick the threads that do not badly interfere with each other. So pick two threads uh, that are not accessing memory often. Right? That way you don't have a lot of interference. Pick, one th uh, pick two threads that have good robot for locality when you schedule them, when the operating system schedules. So of course, these uh, characteristics need to be exposed to the operating system in that case. OK, I'll give you one other thing. This is another general principle in resource management. 
uh, we have, so far we've talked about multi-program workloads. Threads that are running on different cores are independent of each other. Right? I've never talked about what if they're interdependent. And in a parallel application, you have this interdependence. In a multi-thread application, some threads can be on the critical path of execution due to synchronization. Some threads are not. For example, let's say a thread, uh, we briefly covered this actually in the last lecture. A thread uh, captures a lock that's needed by all of the other threads. Now this thread is holding the lock, and it should probably be prioritized, right? Actually, maybe not all of the other threads, but some of the other threads. This thread is holding the lock. It's delaying some other threads, but this thread is memory intensive. What would you like to prioritize? Perhaps you would like to prioritize a thread that's critical, right? That's on the critical path. And that's the idea with parallel applications. You would really like to uh, somehow understand the interdependencies between threads and maximize multi-threaded application performance. So what is one idea? I've given you the basic idea. You somehow estimate limiter threads that are likely to be on the critical path, that are delaying others because of higher level code constructs, synchronization, and uh, prioritize their requests. Then the question is, what do you do with the other threads? Well, uh, in this paper, the solution was to shuffle the priorities of the non-limiter threads because, so that they can make pr proportional progress. It's more complicated than that. That's the basic idea. You can actually use something like thread cluster memory scheduling for the remaining threads. But the key idea is, if you can identify what's on the critical path you can make a much better scheduling decision because this thread is delaying many other threads because it's holding a lock uh, that other threads are waiting for prioritize its requests. In fact, you can be more predictive about it as well. You can predict which thread is going to get to the lock and prioritize its requests so that you prioritize the entire critical path in the system. In fact, thinking about how do you do critical path estimation in a multi-threaded multi program. Once you find the critical path, ideally you would like to prioritize that in all shared resources. And everything else, maybe you just slow down such that everything else completes around the same time. That way you get much better performance as well as power. So if you somehow, going forward, if you somehow identify this criticality or critical path, that's a way of managing resource in a much more intelligent way, way, way than we do it today. Now I'll give you one example. I'll, I'll point you to a paper that discusses some of these issues, how to do a critical path estimation. This is by Jose Joao. Jose Joao. Uh, the idea is called bottleneck identification and scheduling. And the key idea is somehow by instrumenting the locks in a program, you can figure out which locks are most contended. And the idea is for each lock, you associate a thread waiting cycle's value. Whenever a thread is waiting for a lock that's held by uh, another thread, for that given lock, you increment thread waiting cycles. And when a thread gets to a lock that has accumulated lots of thread waiting cycles, you know that that lock has caused lots of thread waiting so far, lots of serialization. Now you know that uh, that, lock, that thread is important to prioritize because it's going to grab that lock. Then the question is, what do you do with it? In this paper, that thread is migrated to a large core so that that thread is executed fast and you get out of that critical section that is delaying other threads, that has delayed other threads in the past. But you could imagine doing the same thing in the memory scheduler as well. So that's why this criticality or identification of critical threads is a general way of doing resource management. And I encourage you to figure out how to do this. This is a tough problem. It's not easy to identify the critical path in a multi-threaded program. Okay, so how do you do this basically? You can read this paper on how to do this, or read this paper uh, as well. You would like to find the thread that's executing the most contended critical section, or you would like to find the thread that's falling behind the most in a parallel for loop. Right? If you have barrier-based synchronization uh, in an application, I guess I don't have that much space here. Maybe here. Let's say all threads start around the same time, and they are reach, uh, racing to a barrier, and at the end of the barrier they will synchronize and something else will happen. Not all threads reach the barrier at the same time. Right? The thread that reaches the barrier last determines the performance of this parallel code. And you would like to ideally equalize the threads in, uh, when, as to when they reach the barrier or minimize the time that's, that threads take to reach the barrier. So you would like to really prioritize this thread that is on your critical path. 
So how do you know that is a big question. And you can read this paper as to, uh, to figure out one mechanism to do that. So I think what I'll do is, I think I'll stop here. Uh, there's more to cover, uh, which is handling interference in the entire memory system. But I've already given you one example of this, which is the source throttling, which is hiding somewhere here. Uh, but I'll stop here and uh, let you ask questions to Dr. Strecker. Hopefully not on this particular topic. <laughs> <laughs> you know more than I do. <laughs> but one question I have for you is, sure. in terms of trying to understand what's, what's happening at the system level as opposed to what's happening at the memory level, and certainly this is one example of it. Another thing might be trying to minimize the power consumption of the system. Uh, and, and, you know, and what, what control do you have over a core? The core is waiting for some reason, either a lot at one level or at a, or a memory graph at another level. What is it doing? Is it consuming the same amount of power as it, uh, when it's waiting, or can you shut it down or what? So that's, that's another dimension. I always like to look at the system level problem I'm trying to solve and then ask what are all the elements in the system that you might use in order to solve that system problem. That's right, exactly. That's a great question. Basically, what do you do? What are the implications on power of this interference or waiting that happens? You could potentially shut down the core for a while, right? You could, so, that, uh, so normally when the core is waiting uh, for a memory request, it's not consuming as much power as it would when it's executing. It's but it's still, if it's well designed, it's, it's, well, if it's well designed, designed. it may be consuming just the same amount, whether it's waiting for memory or not. That's right, that's right, if it's well designed. So you would first like to design the core such that it doesn't consume as much power, but even then, there will be static power that's consumed if you don't shut it off. So you can uh, reduce the static power. So I think some of these principles are especially promising, like criticality, because that can be a general principle for any kind of resource management. If you figure out what to focus on, you can fo uh, which is what is critical, you can focus all a lot of your power and performance management policies on those important things. And for the rest, your goal should be to minimize power, perhaps, right? Because they're not as important until they become important. At that point, <laughs> at that point, you prioritize them. But that's a great question. At the system level, it's, it's always good to think of what else you would do. You're doing something at the memory level that's delaying something else. What, el what, do you, what do you do at the rest of the system to maximize efficiency? We've discussed a number of them actually mm -hmm. at the operating system level with airlock, all the rest of that stuff. There's a whole bunch of things in that. That's right. Any other questions on this topic? I can handle the questions on this topic, not on Max. <laughs> <laughs>